Welcome to the Nitrogen Futures Project introductory video. My name is Susan Zappala and I'm the Senior Air Pollution Advisor at Joint Nature Conservation Committee. This 30 minute video will provide the outcomes of the Nitrogen Futures Project and will tell you a bit about how the project went, what the methods are and how you might be able to use this evidence in future. This presentation will cover the aims of the project, starting with a quick review of why we're concerned about air pollution and the effects on ecosystems in the UK. Then I'll talk a bit about the project team and the methods that were involved. Finally, I'll provide some initial findings that will be quite indicative due to time constraints of this video. Finally, we'll just also discuss the next steps and, and where we see this work going. Nitrogen Futures tried to innovate and, and look into the long term about how we could support policy development to maximize the benefits for ecosystems from reducing emissions, both from nitrogen oxides as well as ammonia. The project helped us to understand the benefit that we get from each of these emission reduction measures and to explore how we can reduce excess nitrogen reaching ecosystems, whilst also improving nutrient use efficiency and the cost benefits of those emission reductions. This was an aim to support sustainable development and green recovery in the UK, whilst maximizing the benefit from emission reductions for people in ecosystems. Nitrogen Features helps us to account for all of the national measures that we're looking to implement here in the UK, but that those will have for our protected areas. Next, I'll tell you a bit about the project team and, and JNCC's role in Nitrogen Features. JNCC, or Joint Nature Conservation Committee, has been leading this project on behalf of DEFRA. JNCC is the public body that helps to bring together UK conservation agency advice and evidence to define the priorities and requirements for UK research, align where possible, and to think about the types of monitoring and actions we might need. JNCC typically works at UK level, but we are also use our UK evidence at international level. So for example, our air, in our air pollution work, we work on the Convention for Long Range Transboundary Air Pollution, and we contribute to the working group on effects there through UK evidence. JNCC also helps with reporting mm -hmm. on the status of biodiversity and ecosystems. So you might have seen our annual biodiversity indicators report that was published recently. JNCC also helped the UK to learn from other countries through knowledge exchange. There's quite a lot in our work that involves partnership working, and Nitrogen Futures was no exception to this. Air pollution is a transboundary issue and one where we deal with our national emissions as well as international emissions. And as such, it was a really good fit within the GNCC agreement. This project involved quite a few different organizations. The project was led by Uli Dragositz from UK Center for Ecology and Hydrology. And she was supported by an extensive project team that included Ether, Rothamsted Research, Air Quality Consultants, Lancaster University's Environment Centre and Manchester Metropolitan University. There was also considerable involvement from the UK conservation agencies and devolved administration governments. We're thankful for this group effort and what they've done for this project and we look forward to using this work with everyone in future to make the best use of the significant effort from so many people. It's important to understand the context about why we're doing this work. Uh, so we'll just look a little bit at an overview of the ecosystem effects from nitrogen. Nitrogen is an important nutrient for plant growth and is used in fertilizer to support food production for a growing global population. However, adding too much nitrogen to the environment can cause air and water pollution, affect ecosystems and soil health, as well as contribute to climate change. And the effects of atmospheric nitrogen on ecosystems is something that many people are not aware of because they typically can't see it. In this image, you'll see that emissions are released into the air from several sources, whether that be from ammonia from agriculture, waste processing or anaerobic digestion, or oxides of nitrogen, which are primarily from combustion processes associated with industry or transport. These react together and form particulate matter and other compounds. And there are two mechanisms that ecosystems are affected by this. One's through the concentration in the air of those pollutants. For example, there will be alkalinity effects from ammonia and sometimes at high concentrations, ammonia can... The other mechanism is deposition. Wet deposition is where compounds in the air 
are literally washed out through precipitation, whether that be rain or snow. And there's also dry deposition, which when the compounds react together in air, are acted upon by gravity and settle onto the ground. These deposited compounds can change the pH of our habitats or increase the amount of nutrients in places that are adapted to low nutrient situations, and that will impact our biodiversity. Nitrogen deposition is a major driver of biodiversity loss in the UK and a widespread issue for our UK habitats. And although significant improvements in air quality have been made over the years, over 50% per 7, 7 of our protected area land is threatened by damaging levels of nitrogen deposition. In this image, a relatively healthy sphagnum moss is shown on the left next to ammonia damaged moss that's degrading and burnt. Although the threat's not visible from the air, its effects are very clear in this case. Now that we know the context for the project, we'll tell you a little bit more about details of the project, its methods, and some initial results. Nitrogen Features was quite innovative in a few different ways. It considered effects of all types of emissions rather than focusing on one sector. The models used in the work have been updated and the results have 20 times five times higher resolution than we might recognize in national reporting. Another major improvement was to include long-term thinking to 2030 and beyond. This ensures we can account for our national clean air strategies and the effect of long-term solutions, such as tree planting or infrastructure investment. Finally, the work provided optimized options for both air quality, concentrations in air, and press around ecosystems through nitrogen deposition. That provides flexibility for the widest variety of stakeholders who are looking to prove, improve air quality and protect and enhance ecosystems. Now we'll go a bit more detail into the nitrogen features method. This section provides a quick overview of how the modeling chain builds on itself so that when you're looking at the maps and results, it's easier to understand the changes represented. The project focuses uh, we are looking to do supplement what's being done right now. So this includes the Clean Air Strategy 2019, the Clean Air Plan for Wales that's just been recently published, and the second review of Cleaner Air for Scotland, as well as the Ammonia Strategy in Northern Ireland. Nitrogen Features quantifies how those national strategies help protected areas, and then looks at the extra effect from supplemental measures that we might be able to do as part of local planning or sustainable farming schemes. In this image, you can see we started with the 2017 baseline for concentration and deposition in the UK. And then on top of this was applied the national strategies. This includes the National Air Pollution Control Plan, as well as other devolved administration actions up to 2030. These are incorporated in a realistic way into the modeling to understand what effect national measures will have at protected site level. That then gives us what's happening in 2030 under the current plans and provides a basis to test different interventions for both oxidized nitrogen as well as ammonia reduction. I'll take a little bit more about examples of interventions later on in the presentation. It's just worth knowing that the scenarios that were modeled had bundles of emission reduction measures to keep the modeling refined to fit project timescales. The work also includes optimization both for concentration and deposition. That's because these have two different effects on ecosystems and had two potentially different outcomes for cost benefit. This first example of the project outputs demonstrates the baselines that we were talking about. So on the left is the ammonia concentration across the UK in 2017 and may look familiar to some of you. As you can see, we have quite a lot of variation across the country, but there are hot spots. Areas in red are at or above four micrograms of ammonia per meter cubed, and this is damaging to all types of plants. Areas in red and purple um, are our higher risk areas. The areas in blue, like those in the more remote parts of Scotland and the highland areas in Wales and England, are below one microgram per meter cubed of ammonia. And that's protective of lichen, bryophytes, and mosses, or what we call lower plants. On the right hand side is the change in ammonia concentration from 2017 as a result of national measures and what would happen in 2030. 
And this demonstrates the effect of the National Air Pollution Control Plan and other devolved administration actions being implemented. In many areas, you can see that the concentration of ammonia drops by about one and a half micrograms per meter cubed. In other areas that are red or pink, though, ammonia concentration is increasing. So, for example, you'll see that near London, there are red areas, even with the national measures, because of changes in population, housing development or agricultural development that cause an increase in emissions. White areas show where there's really very little change. Now we'll talk about the different scenarios that we looked at and see where those were used in more detail. To test realistic measures to reduce oxidized nitrogen, several methods were employed. This include things that might be familiar to people such as low emission zones or no emission zones. And then for more ambitious measures, an allowance of 10 to 15% reduction was used to represent a toolbox approach. This allows for the variety of methods that could be used in a local area. The reductions for nitrogen oxides were only applied to larger cities, so over 400,000 population, because that's where the intervention would make the most difference. For the ammonia scenarios, there are several approaches that could be taken, including displacement and emission reduction. Displacement is applied to an existing emission source around a protected area. They're moved away from the protected area by a defined distance, or certain activities might not be allowed around that protected area, whereas reduction measures reduce the magnitude of the existing emission. Examples of that include low emission spreading, changes to protein levels in animal diets, control of animal housing emissions, changes to fertilizer regimes, which would mean they move away from urea-based fertilizers, and that sort of reducing activity. Dairy and cattle measures were modeled separately because the UK actively regulates pig and poultry, but cattle and dairy are still under consideration. As such, dairy and cattle-related measures were considered long-term scenarios and separated to make it easier to understand the benefits in a way that's helpful for planning and strategy development. We'll just go a little bit further into what each of these scenarios really mean and what spatial targeting is, what displacement is, and, and how that works. There are two mechanisms used in the ammonia measures, displacement of emissions and reduction of emissions. Emission sources are displaced by moving them a set distance from the area being protected. And although the pressure on the protected area will reduce, the total amount of emissions will not be reduced. This means that there will be an increase in concentration in the area where the emission sources are relocated to, even though there will be a decrease in the area where they were moved from. One of the key aspects of this project was to test out how a rollout of measures at national level concerning all the areas of the UK compared to targeting measures around certain areas or protected sites. This means you might spend less on the measures as a whole, but potentially gain the same benefits for a specific area. The protected area in this case is represented by the red boundary in the figure. Please don't take the tractors to mean anything except for an emission reduction more generally in that area. This usually involves something with agriculture for a lot of the local sources, but it could very well just be a road or, or an industrial facility. Spatial targeting then says, let's have the emission reductions within a set distance represented by the concentric rings in this figure. In this project, these distances for reduction measures were spatially targeted at two or five kilometers. And for displacement, the distance was one kilometer. And that was to avoid overlapping displacement zones. And it was considered that the displacement zone would probably be prohibitive. Next, we'll talk about the modeling and how that worked within nitrogen features. Each emission reduction scenario, uh, made up of the measures we discussed earlier, is represented by a funnel in this image. Uh, they were a bundle of nitrogen oxide and ammonia measures with different levels of spatial targeting or different levels of ambition for uptake and subsequent emission reductions from that. There were 15 different emission scenarios that came out of this work. And each of these gets entered into the model as an emission reduction map that represents that bundle of measures. As you do with your annual updates for background pollution, the work is calibrated to the UK monitoring network. 
That's then run through the frame and seabed models to get a concentration map. Those results were produced at one kilometer grid square, which is over 25 times the current five kilometer grid maps. That's overlaid then with the various things we use to measure benefit or our 13 metrics, whether that be compared to critical loads and levels that tell us what would be damaging or not for habitat, or aspect about the pressure on the site, such as the number of emission sources or emission density. This project was quite innovative in that it also focused on trying to find different ways to measure benefits from the emission reductions and the cost benefits of these bundles of measures. There were emission related measurements or metrics used to look at the benefits, such as the number of sources or amount of nitrogen emitted around a site. We also looked at the exposure of habitat to air pollution through changes in concentration or deposition as you would normally expect, but then also looked at habitat effects. The area of habitat exceeding critical load was quantified, as well as the number of sites moving out of these damaging levels of nitrogen deposition or ammonia concentration. Full details of the 13 benefit metrics and their developments can be found in Annex 3 of the main report, and all project materials can be found through the Nitrogen Features webpage. In this video, we'll provide a few examples of the results from Nitrogen Features. The comprehensive results are available in the main report with country-specific analyses in Appendix 4. The first example of some results will look at the difference from the 2030 national measures baseline scenario in relation to two of the scenarios. On the left is a map that shows air quality in 2030 if emission reductions were made in a two-kilometer zone around protected areas, and they were added on top of those national commitments. You can see a broad scale reduction represented by blue colors, sometimes up to five kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year, with no red dots in there incre indicating increases. On the right is a map showing what happens with the one kilometer displacement zone if we displace those emission sources within one kilometer around the protected area. This has a much more interesting picture with a lot more red to indicate increases outside of the displacement zones. That's important to keep in mind when you're looking at the cost benefit as there are consequences of moving sources away from certain areas without also reducing those missions overall. If you look a little bit closer at Wales, for example, you'll see bright red areas where nitrogen deposition increases. In this example, there seems to be more protection for protected sites, but quite widespread effects and potentially undesirable change in air quality for people and ecosystems outside of those areas. The other aspect we looked at is the direct effect on habitat through concentrations in air and highlighting where areas are coming in and out of these damaging levels. Again, there are two scenarios explored that represent emission reductions within two kilometers of the protected area and a one kilometer displacement zone on top of the national measures. These again have results for 2030. The circles show the extra number of sites that would come out of exceedance of their critical levels for ammonia, and they get larger with the number of sites in each category. These areas would no longer have levels of ammonia that are damaging to lichen and mosses. The results vary across the country, and with the displacement zone, quite a few more sites come out of exceedance. But we'll need to remember that this also means that a lot of other areas of wider habitat outside of the protected areas might have been put at risk because the emissions increase in those areas. Please remember these are only two results out of the 15 scenarios and 13 metrics, just to give a flavor of the presentation and output from the Nitrogen Features work. The full results are available in the main report accessible through the Nitrogen Features webpage. The project also undertook a cost benefit analysis and the exact calculations will vary depending on the benefit that's being looked at. The general approach takes the amount of benefit, whether that be through reduction of emissions or the amount of exceedance. It compares this to the cost of interventions in the package of mitigation. Again, here we're looking at the same scenarios, two kilometer emission reduction and one kilometer displacement scenario. But in this case, we're also looking at the scenario optimized for concentrations of ammonia in air which would make more areas protected for lichen and moss. In the two kilometer buffer zone, almost 13,000 extra hectares are protected on top of the national measures. With the cost effectiveness ratio of 0.6, 
when looking at the amount of extra hectares protected per 5 million pounds. In comparison, displacement shows quite high cost effectiveness, but we're not able to account for the damage costs from displacing it to other areas in this analysis. That's something to be very careful of when you're interpreting the results. For the optimized scenario, over 80,000 hectares are protected on top of the national measures. And the cost benefit ratio here is higher at 1.7, which is almost three times more effective than the emission reduction scenario and has more than six times the amount of hectares protected than the emission reduction scenario. This demonstrates the need to really consider local conditions when we're trying to use spatial targeting if we really want to get the most benefit from our investment. Now we'll discuss a little bit about testing the national modeling at local level and look at some local case studies. The project had quite a focus on trying to test national modeling, but we also wanted to ground truth this at the local level. We looked at 15 local case studies with a variety of habitats and levels of background pollution. The case studies range from areas with high pollutant levels and a concentrated population or a lot of industrial activity to relatively clean areas like Loch Navar in Northern Ireland or Ben Derg in Scotland. The case studies cover various emission source types that are typical in the UK and had quite a good geographical spread. The local case studies compared national modeling results with results derived from much more detailed modeling and monitoring data taken at those local sites. This was used to determine the, if the national based analysis that we did for each of the scenarios was relevant at local level. In many cases, pretty much without exception, the national modeling was very useful for identifying areas at risk and for helping to prioritize the types of activity and where you might want to intervene. However, it did not cover all local needs. For example, if a road's going straight through a designated site, the one kilometer grid square helps you to prioritize your activity at national level, but then you really need to do more investigation to reflect change that could be contributed to that road scheme itself. That's because the road will have an influence that's much less than one kilometer wide, typically. Geography and site situation were also found to be important at local level. Applicability of certain measures could be influenced by whether the site was primarily affected by transboundary pollution or if the pressure was from local sources. And the types of emissions and controls available also influence which approach is most appropriate. Nitrogen futures helps to provide some quantification to supplement what we know about this at a qualitative level. Now we'll just cover a few general conclusions from the Nitrogen Futures project. Nitrogen Futures concluded that in order to reduce the amount of nitrogen reaching protected areas to levels that we expect not to be damaging, we'll need more than just national measures. On a positive note, many of the national targets are likely to be met by these extra measures that we're taking. This includes the National Emission Ceilings Directive commitment to actions and the Clean Air Strategy 17% reduction of damaging deposition. Further work, however, is required if we want to meet biodiversity targets in the round. Spatial targeting proved to be the most cost beneficial for protected areas whilst helping to meet those national targets. The optimized scenarios show that trying to look at your local circumstances and tailor the measures to each area has the greatest cost benefit. There was also quite a lot of variation amongst UK countries observed in the results. We found that quite interesting. It does really reinforce that there's no one size fits all solution for the UK. Key factors affecting country specific results were how many emission sources were around protected areas, also known as emission density, also the sources of those emissions and whether they were far away from or close to sensitive habitats, and how high the existing background pollution was played a significant part in these results. For areas that have a lot more pressure from air pollution was much greater because you could reduce existing emissions by more. This slide also shows a graph on the right hand side that provides an example of part of the reason that the country specific variation exists. Uh, and this is through breakdown of the pollutant types we looked at. The red and pink areas are for reduced nitrogen or ammonia and the green areas are for oxidized nitrogen. And you can see some interesting trends. I mean, oxidized nitrogen is the highest contributor in Scotland to nitrogen deposition, 
but in Northern Ireland is relatively low. And that difference will influence the way you design your policy interventions or think about types of emissions that you might want to tackle. Now we'll discuss the next steps for nitrogen futures because the evidence production is one thing, but now we want to use that evidence. We're really excited about this project because it's been groundbreaking for us and involved a lot of people to make the work useful for UK countries. And we're now looking to think about how we can use the evidence and data in future. The intention is to use nitrogen futures data for strategic planning, site restoration support, fulfilling biodiversity duties or other ambitions. Nitrogen futures can help with prioritizing areas where organizations may want to provide advice or incentives, such as in sustainable farming schemes. And the quantification in nitrogen futures helps identify what level of ambition is required to meet a specific target. And it also ensures targets are realistic. Nitrogen futures helps understand what contributions are from each UK country at each protected area and the local benefit of UK country clean air strategies. Baselines consider other country commitments as well, like Republic of Ireland and Netherlands, that are signed up to the National Emission Ceilings Directive and to account for those international effects. Nitrogen Futures Report has now been published and we'll be holding several workshops to explore with stakeholders how the work can be used. A non-technical report is being produced to assist with discussions that you might want to have with colleagues and stakeholders. Over 500 potential data sets to be published and we're prioritizing release of the data sets to ensure these are easy to use as well. Several workshops are planned to help explore how nitrogen futures can be used or adapted. There are country specific workshops for the UK, but also themed workshops for subjects such as farming, as well as discussion of new benefit metrics or analyses and the applicability of the work to risk assessment. Future work will include quantifying benefit for wider ecosystems outside of protected areas. And please do join the stakeholder list if you want to be updated on progress. Thank you very much for listening and for your time today. And please do get in touch by email and social media if you would like to know more. And we look forward to working with everybody. As discussed, there's a stakeholder list that you can sign up to if you'd like to learn more about JNCC air pollution projects and keep regularly updated. Thanks very much.